American Issues, take one. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. We're going to talk about Trump's machinations around documents. And we have for this uh, Cynthia Sinclair, longtime contributor, and Jeffrey Portnoy, uh, our esteemed special guest. Hi, gentlemen, ladies. What does machinations mean? Um, strange maneuvers. I, can, I, I went, can I say that? I went to public school. Um, it's time for you to go back. And <laughs> What, what what grade would you like to? Never mind. Um, when okay. I, when I play Scrabble. I only play Scrabble if people don't use more than two syllables. <laughs> but don't play for money. <laughs> <laughs> so um, you know, it strikes me that the real question here is: uh, So Trump is at war uh, with the FBI, the DOJ, and maybe the larger law enforcement government community in general. Um, and every day brings us new revelations about it. And he's uh, really occupying the space, so to speak, and somehow putting the, the basic investigation, um, you know, in the background. And uh, in terms of the news, we're not following that so much as uh, we're following his machinations. Um, so my question to you, uh, let me start with you, Cynthia. We are at war, or rather he is at war um, with the FBI, with the DOG, with the Biden government in general. Why? Why is he doing this now? Um, and I know there is a lot of possible reasons, but can you identify some of them? All right. First, machination means a plot or a scheme. Just thought I'd throw that out there first. Thank you. Thank you. And Jeff, thanks you. <laughs> okay. I like the word. The plot's better and scheme's even better. <laughs> I can spell both of those. <laughs> there you go. Schemes sort of tends to um imply that they're not exactly legal or up and up above board right schemes kind of sounds like something that somebody does behind you know in the dark when it's not really right but okay so that leads me right to the um new york times had a great article that i i really recommend everyone to read all of but the title is Trump without the presidency's projections and protections struggles for a strategy. Because we know he's gone through first, it didn't happen, right? He only took what was his. Then it happened, but it was all declassified before it was sent out. No, then it was all declassified upon standing order. Then it was, let's see, they had no right to come. All he had to do was, all we had to do was ask and he would have been happy to give it back. Uh, let's see, what, there must be at least 10 different plots that he has tried to put forward as his reason, right, for, for taking all these things home. We have yet to hear anything as to why he retained those other boxes when all he gave was the 15. He does not say anything about that. But we do know that his lawyer has now, or two lawyers of his, have now filed something in another federal courthouse, what, 80 miles away from the one that's handling this one. Um, and they didn't, they said they want to, uh, special master to go over all of the things that were that were recovered after the search. Well, it's funny that he didn't even mention that. And usually that's done immediately so that it stops any other investigation without being done, you know, without that special master being present. Well, that's usually done immediately. This is what, two weeks later? And I believe the reason he's doing it is because he heard it on MSNBC. Um, Ali, um, no, Ari Melber was doing a show and he was interviewing one of the lawyers that Trump had asked to come work for him, but the lawyer refused. He said, no, no, I don't think it's for me. So as, um, as Ari is, is uh, interviewing him, he says, well, what I would have done, first thing I would have done is appoint a special um, master. And then what? The next day, they're filing paperwork to ask for a special master. I think the media needs to stop giving these guys so many 
ideas on where to go next. Well, <laughs> you, you know, you have to look at this on multiple levels. On one level, politically, Trump is a master. He is so far ahead of the Democrats, the media. He has learned how to manipulate his supporters. And what he's doing is brilliant from a political level. It's brilliant. He has galvanized his folks who were losing emphasis on you know, the stealing the election, it's kind of getting worn. Now, he's the first president to ever have his home invaded by the, you know, uh, enemy. They came in, they ransacked his house. He files a 29 page affidavit filled with brilliant political rhetoric. And he's galvanized his 35% base which was becoming ungalvanized on a single issue. So whatever anybody wants to say, it's a politically great move by Trump. And every time he files a lawsuit, whether he wins or loses, his base says, go get him and reads what he puts in. And as long as he can find lawyers who will work without pay, because that's his history, he will continue to do these kinds of things. Now, legally, what he may or may not have done in taking documents that were classified, that's a whole other issue. But, you know, by, by forcing the Justice Department to come in on a raid using his word and Fox's word, it's brilliant. And the Justice Department was, you know, left with the Hobson's choice. Do they give him this political opportunity and allow him to keep whatever he may have taken? Or do they go and seize that stuff and deal with the fallout? And right now, he's winning. I believe he's winning in the court of public opinion, and not just with his base, because the Justice Department is put in a position of fighting to keep this secret, which they need to do to continue their criminal investigation while the election is two months off. So sorry to say, but uh, as bad a man as he is, he certainly knows how to go with the political wins. So Jeff, what's what's the proper response? What can be done? Well, what this, done by know, the DOJ, yeah. what can be, you know, done by the Democratic Party? Yeah, I don't think the, the word is proper, you know? <laughs> there is no proper response. There are two responses, political response and legal response. I think they got their hands tied politically because they can't divulge legally what's in the application for the subpoena, nor what they seized. They're stuck. They are stuck. Now they're in court fighting back and forth on whether the magistrate is going to unseal bits and pieces. He went from saying, yeah, I might, to now, no, I don't think I can unseal because whatever I would unseal would make the rest of it worthless. So, you know, I don't know what you do. I think you just have to continue to count the days till the uh, September, till the January 6th committee issues its report coming in the next two weeks. And then hopefully something can move forward on the legal front so that people can see exactly what was taken and not have to rely on Trump's affidavit in support of his motion. And the special master, I've been a special master. It's a convenient tool that a judge uses so that the judge himself or herself doesn't have to spend hours and hours going through documents. So they appoint usually some attorney and say, hey, can you look at this stuff and be my eyes and ears? And, you know, I think Asking for a special master was brilliant. Whether it was late or not is a whole other issue. And I suspect one will be appointed, but so what? The special master can't release the information. Anyway, you know, I, I just think they did what they had to do to continue their investigation, but it opened up an opportunity for Trump to regalvanize his base. Mm. That's on the political level, but on the legal level, you know, you talk about a special master. You know, there have been dozens of people, Trump's acolytes, who do not have 
security clearances. I saw one piece that he doesn't have a security clearance. And these documents have moved from one to the other. They've been, you know, tossed around, traveled, God knows what, reorganized, uh, and maybe taken. You know, I'm not convinced that we have them all back yet. Um, so, you know, to put a special master in, you do have a question of security clearance, even for the judge to go through them document by document. Why does he have to do that? Uh, there was a, there was an affidavit. There was a warrant. There was a seizure. It's, that's it. Uh, now you let the, uh, you know, the investigator continue his work. Uh, what Trump would like to do is get as many people involved in this as he possibly can and, and put the whole notion of security clearance and and security information and nuclear secrets aside. Um, and he's done that. And that is also brilliant, you know, creating the chaos. Uh, but, uh, you know, Cynthia, you had a, your hand up. What were you going to add to that? <laughs> um, well, I don't know as we can give him all the credit for being brilliant. He has had a lot of smart people that are giving him advice. And so I don't know as I credit him with being smart enough. Well, I think Jeff's point is the own. overarching thing is that he wants to be center of stage. He wants to create chaos. Every day is a new crazy day for him. And he is succeeding in that. And he oh, is right. sucking the oxygen out of, uh, out of the FBI's investigation. And, and he gets his accolades in the Congress to come out day after day that when we take over on November 2nd, we're going to investigate the FBI. We're going to have hearing after hearing on, on Garland and the Justice Department. We're going to get to the bottom of this raid on a president's private residence when he's no longer president day after day after day. And frankly, November 2nd is six weeks away. So they have a tremendous advantage because it's unlikely any of us are going to have a clue what was seized by then. So, you know, the irony, they want to defund the FBI. What happened with defunding the police? <laughs> well, uh, you know, it's whatever, whatever terms you want at a given moment. Yeah, sure. Uh, it's, you know, the flavor of the day. Of uh, course, the FBI director was appointed by Trump, but they don't rarely, they rarely bring that up, if ever. Well, and they tried from day down. one to corrupt the FBI. You know, the, the book and the movie, um, about uh, uh, James uh, Comey. What are you going to say, uh, Cynthia? Oh, I, I was going to say, and he signed off on the warrant that went to Mar-a-Lago to get this search and seizure. Yeah. I mean, the whole idea, when you think about it, it, it's almost, it's almost like a grim fairy tale. It, it, it's, it's impossible to conceive. If we had had this conversation five years ago, hypothetically. Jay, you wanted to have a program on, can there ever be a time in our democracy when there's going to be a, a, a search warrant <laughs> issued to a former president? We would have laughed for a half hour and said, what are, you, what are you on, drugs? This is what our country has become. It is a terrible black mark on the country. And to think that a third of the country believes that this was a political move to defame a former president is a very sad commentary on where we are. I well, the troubling thing about that. If I, if I might, I think you're forgetting that you guys probably would have laughed pretty hard too if anybody had said that a former president was going to take national archives, top secret national archives and keep them in an unlocked basement. You probably would have laughed then too, huh? Uh, probably. <laughs> but well, who, I thought, I, but you know, this reflects this reflects that that one third and maybe others in the middle, you know, um, they they kind of um, they kind of believe Trump, and and he's uh, he cast so much doubt on the government and you know legitimate law enforcement uh, that you know they they can't really see the clarity that you know there's there's the, the point here is that he improperly, illegally took these things. Mm -hmm. And yet that seems to be buried. Why is it buried? Why do people you know, set that aside? Uh, he's very influential. People believe him. Why? Uh, you know. Why, Jay? Yeah. There's one quote from Trump that all of us should never forget. You know what it is? It's mine. No. 
I can shoot somebody on Fifth Street. Nobody you got can... it. I can walk down Park <laughs> Avenue or Broadway in New York and shoot somebody, and no one will think less of me. Don't ever, that's a paraphrase. That's Donald Trump. That's been his life as a person, as a realtor, as a slumlord, as a president. The man is Teflon. It's the saddest thing in the world. And you can be Teflon when you're a slumlord. But when you become Teflon as the president of the United States, we've got real problems. Well, I mean, he's, he's, you know, he's gone far beyond the mob. <laughs> the mob would pay off a few policemen, you know, maybe a prosecutor here or there. Um, you know, maybe he's a born a witness or a juror. But Trump goes right to the top. <laughs> it's it's way worse than the mob ever did. <laughs> so um, so what you know you're predicting some bad things, but um, I don't know if we've gotten to all of it yet because uh, you know if if they indeed persist in the attack on the law enforcement community, what it means is when they get back in office, um, they will not only undermine the law enforcement community, they will use the law enforcement community to deprive of us of civil rights, uh, to take cases against the media, to take cases against anyone who criticizes them. So it turns the whole thing on its head. We are we are in, you know, you say a brilliant planner. You're right. And this is the chaos phase. But after the chaos phase, you have the assimilation of the consolidation of new power. And the new power is, uh, it's not let's kill all the lawyers because he has so many possibilities there that wouldn't work. Let's kill all the media. Let's kill anyone who opposes us. Um, and, you know, he doesn't have to be president to achieve that. We are seeing that now, aren't we? It's um, time, so to re time to reread Lord of the Flies. It um, is. Because <laughs> that's what we're living in. Yes. Fiction has become nonfiction. Fortunately, we still have some constraints and restraints that have not permitted the total takeover like in Lord of the Flies, but we are very close. We are very close. Just imagine if in 2024, this Republican Party, as sick and deranged as it is, takes over the Senate and the presidency. Get ready. Lots of us will be leaving for greener pastures because this country will be a country that no one has ever seen or even heard of since the Puritans. Yeah, or since Germany. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, you know, I, 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 I do worry about that. And I, and I feel that people don't realize how close we are to that. They don't realize that you know, right now you, you lead your life in an ordinary fashion. It doesn't affect you uh, unless, unless you tune into programs like this. Uh, you don't think about it. Uh, and yet, it's, it's, as you say, it's just weeks away we're going to have this really violent change in our in our politics and our political system, and then it's going to be a real cold shocker. And you know, I mean, I, I like to find some good news, and you know, you see, the media is always trying to find some good news to bolster it up to say. Well, there's the there's there's some good news. The recent polls, and, and even the Senate Majority Leader, have basically conceded that unless something dramatic happens in the next six weeks, the Democrats will hold on to the Senate and may even pick up a vote or two. Now, who knows? Who would have said that two months ago? I certainly uh -huh. wouldn't have. It's pretty uh -huh. likely they're going to get creamed in the House. The question is by how many. But if they can hold on to the Senate, they can stop anything horrible from happening other than the House holding hearing after hearing. But they won't be able to pass any legislation. Now, if something happens in the next six weeks and some of these even the Republican leadership admits are awful candidates. That was pretty amazing what McConnell said the other day. You, you can say what you want about McConnell. He's pretty duplicitous. Big word for me, by the way. Can't spell it. But when he comes out and says, Cynthia can help you. When he comes out and says, we're not going to take the Senate because we don't have very good candidates. He's not talking about, you know, anything other than they're morons. They're morons in Georgia and in Ohio. And in Pennsylvania, and wherever Oz is running, uh, oh, Pennsylvania, I forgot. I mean, this is a joke. 
this is a joke. And now the Republicans even admit, well, we should have found people with an IQ over 90 and they probably would have won. You know, one of Herschel Walker's platform points. <laughs> Go ahead. There's so many of them. It's, it's trees. Trees. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There are, quote, there are too many damn trees, end quote. Uh, <laughs> we've got to get rid of the trees. We're laughing. Yeah. The guy is the Republican nominee to be the U.S. <laughs> senator from Georgia. We can laugh all we want. We can laugh about Pennsylvania. Thank God they're idiots, but they got nominated. Yeah, well, you're, you're taking us back to the first place, but but maybe with a with a Democratic Senate, we at least stop some of the real. Well, yeah, no, that's the only hope. Because you said, is there any hope? Well, what about the base? You know, I mean, there's been so many reports about the base, uh, you know, leaving him or shrinking in some way. And and, I mean, that? maybe where's it's the proof? Where's the proof? Um, I can't give you proof. I can only give you, you know, uh, these, uh, you know, uh, these these newspaper articles that talk about, you know, some some kind of poll. Um, but we, you know, we certainly we can't accept that as evidence. Uh, and and I, I don't know where where does it go? It's 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 not it's not entirely poppycock. There must be some members of the base saying, "Wait a minute." Yeah, Liz Cheney. <laughs> Look what happened to her. <laughs> no, I mean I wouldn't consider her part of the base, Jeff. <laughs> yeah. What, what do you think about that? Is that is that going to change? Um, is Liz Cheney actually going to you know take her? new political organization forward and and grab some members of the base, grab some of you know, the more conservative classical Republicans? Well, I think I think Liz Cheney has got a, a very steel eyed focus on doing anything and everything she can to undermine Trump and his reputation um, and the truth of who he really is. And and so I think that is a good thing. Um, one of the things that's a very big danger for Democrats is this new $1.8 billion of dark money that is suddenly going to get to just infuse the Republican, you know, the, the whole GOP. It's a lot of money to, you know, to spread around. And in the article that I was reading about this dark money that had come down, um, it said that already uh, that a hundred million dollars, is this even possible? A hundred million dollars had already been spent on legal fees for Trump in New York and in Georgia. Between yeah, I don't, I don't believe that at all. I thought that was like, wait a minute. That's so absurd. How much, how much um, credit and credibility do we give to this dark money thing too? Because it was all in the same article that I read. Well, even if it isn't 100 million, you know, 1.6 billion makes you feel pretty good about what taking crazy options, machinations, if you will. Uh, and I think that's funding his uh, exuberance on this. What's, so we've got the all these... What's the definition of dark money? Well, well, was, you don't know where it came from. Well, you don't know where but the in this, in this money case, is either. We I mean, do know in this case, the, the article I think you're talking about said that it came from a tech mogul by the name of um, Harry, H-A-R-R-E. Yeah, well. L-L-E-I. You know, as long as the Supreme Court keeps Citizens United, get get used to it. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I think sometimes the liberals fight the wrong battles. You know, they fight this battle about so-called dark money coming from billionaires. They're getting plenty of money from billionaires for their own quote, dark money. I, I just think they, they don't focus on winning issues. And, you know, we talked in a couple of shows ago against abortion and maybe that showed itself yesterday in the primary yeah. in New York, yeah. you know, where the Democrat beat the Republican. Yeah. That, that's a decent sign. I, I didn't think abortion be candid was gonna carry the day but gas prices are going down. Inflation is steady. They passed the huge spending bill for climate control, whatever. I don't think the Democrats are going to win the House. But uh, student maybe loans there's a, today, student loans. Yeah, well, that's a smart political move, even though it's really, we could talk about that. You borrow money and then somebody saves you and says you don't have to pay it back. Is that not political pandering or why? I mean, let's be honest. But it helps. 
Yeah, but I if, think if the Republicans did it, opposite, you guys. The re- I'm sorry, but I think you got it backwards. I think that the Republicans are going to be able to use that one. Oh, of course. Oh, see, there goes the Democrats spending more money. They're going to use that as a Democrat. Oh, absolutely. But, you know, the Democrats figured there's a lot more voters between 18 and 34 right. that'll go to the polls and remember that they just saved, what, 10 grand at least? I didn't read the whole story. So I think everybody gets 10 saying? grand off. So wait, that means that the same number of people that are saying that are the same number of people that were thinking are going to be part of his base and stick with him. But yet, so they're not that important or they, so it's like a, who knows what, I know that a lot of the polls, like Jay was saying, a lot of the polls coming out over this last week and including like you pointed out the you know, the majority leader, I mean, that minority leader in the Senate Oh, you know, uh, Mitch McConnell comes out and says that he doesn't think they're going to be able to keep the House because of the the quality of candidates. You mean the Senate? The, well, you mean you mean the Senate? Really important yeah. because every one of those candidates that he's talking about are the ones that are claiming, oh, the big lie. That's what they're saying. They're all about the big lie, and so I think that's a something to look at. In this. You know, the problem is, is nobody standing up and saying, you don't really need a special master for this. It's an investigation. You don't, yeah. you don't need to, you know, redact the affidavit. It is the affidavit and, and it's damn secret. It's got to be secret. It involves secret information, nuclear information. We can't let that out. Uh, what are you guys doing? No, but it's, it's a political ploy. That's exactly what they want. But, but yes, but somebody... Somebody has to stand up and say that. They don't want a special master. They want some court to say no. That's what their base wants. They don't want a special master. It's brilliant. It's brilliant politics. I guarantee you, if you got them in a room and put them under a lie detector, they would say, no, we don't want a special. We want somebody to say we can't have one. So we can then go out and say, look how unfair this is. All we wanted was a neutral person. It's and, brilliant. And Jeff, that, that, would, that would explain why their their motions were written so badly that the judge had to send it back to them and say, wait a minute, you need to. Well, you they, know, didn't write, they didn't write this. a legal document. They wrote a political screed. Right. And well, then but, you know, I the think judge you're, you're even a... had to make an, a suggestion like, so are you asking for us to put a hold on this so that nobody can do anything until the decision is made? And it's like the lawyer should have been asking that and the judge should not have been um, recommending it or, you know, that's what gets me is the judge, wait a minute, shouldn't the judge just say, every judge I've ever been in front of or dealt with, they can't tell you what to say or what to ask for. They can only ju- rule on what you ask for. That's the judge's job, right? We, don't have, we don't have clarity. We don't have any, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, leader from the Democratic Party standing up and saying, steely, steely-like, what did you call her, Liz Cheney? Uh, steel, steel-clad, uh, you know, clear thinking and saying, you know, th- this is all chaos. He's created the chaos. But I want to go back to one thing you said, which is really worth dwelling on. So he took these documents when he left the White House and, and he, took, he took them here, he took them there. Um, some went to the archives, but most of them didn't. Um, there, it's clearly an offense. It's clearly wrong. All the lawyers around him must have known that, and yet it happened. And, and your point early, early, early in this conversation, Jeff, um, is that this is part of a larger plan. This was a time bomb he created in leaving, just like that woman Murphy who refused to accept, um, you know, that Biden was the president. He, administrator of the GSA, uh, refused to accept that Biden was the president. This was another time bomb intended to hobble Biden's administration, but also, and this is the revelation now, also part of a long-term plan where he would get through these ridiculous negotiations with the archives, archives people, and stave them off and give them a whole bunch of, you know, delay tactics um, and never actually give them anything. Uh, All I'm just p- testing this on you, all in the plan that ultimately he was going to force, as you said, 
the FBI to do an investigation, if it dared, um, and to do the search warrant. And it comes, what, 10 months later, whatever it is, nine months later. Um, and he planned this early. This was all a sequence of events, a bunch of step transactions, where the ultimate plan was to get into a contention and use it politically with his base. Would you agree with me that he had, not in detail, but the general idea going from the beginning? I don't know about that, but as I said earlier, I think Stop the Steal is running out of momentum. And I think they thought, we need something else to galvanize our base. What do we need? Well, we could use some inner city riots, but unless some police officers go ahead and shoot some more black people, we may not have that. What else can we do? Now, I, I'm not sure they were smart enough to figure out, well, we're just gonna take a bunch of papers and force them to come into my home and, and, and seize them. But the way it's worked out, Jay, that was my point. It's given them something to galvanize about six weeks before the election. And yeah, they're still stopped to steal people, but it doesn't have the same momentum. This has given them true momentum for his base to go to the polls or do worse, unfortunately, right? That's the really sick and scary thing. The threats on FBI agents, the threats on judges, the threats on election officials. This has given them something to rally around. And that's what they're doing. Look at Fox. Day after day, they don't do stop the steal anymore. They talk about how can you enter the home of a former president and seize boxes. I mean, that, that was my point. It's I don't a know fantastic, if they it's a fantastic a lie. It's a war. It's creating a, a kind of a more legalistic insurrection, if you will, yeah. uh, with the same people involved. And, and what is missing in the scene, and we're going to get to closing points in a minute, what's missing in the scene is somebody standing up, Jeff, and saying exactly what you're saying and what Cynthia is saying. Hey, let's look at this, you know, with clarity. What is, what is really going on here? And, 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 you know, it's based on ignorance and misinformation and disinformation of the same sort of, of, of lying as Stop the Steal was. Same thing. Uh, and nobody, nobody from the Democratic side is getting up there to do any leadership. Uh, and and this, this is like one hand clapping. That's what we have. This is a war with one hand clapping. He, he holds the territory. Um, and we can't, as a, the Democratic Party can't stop him. Okay, well, that, that, those are my thoughts. But let me hear your final thoughts about this subject. And remember, this is, um, you know, how are the machinations doing? Where are they going? How they, were, how they are affecting our, our country? Uh, let's do you first, Cynthia. Okay, well, um, we know that that Cash Patel guy and is it Brett Solomon? I can't remember the Solomon's first name. Cash Patel talked about the magic, the magic declassification. The magic declassification. Well, yeah. this, there, we go back a little bit, like we're talking about all these, trying to connect the dots all the way through. Cash Patel and the Solomon guy were actually appointed to work with the archives before they even left the office. In the last weeks before Trump left, that's when he appointed those two guys to do all that stuff. Then immediately as this whole uh, FBI search and the, the, you know, the trying to get documents back from the archives, all of that stuff, Cash Patel has been talking and talking and, you know, just covering their butt, coming up with this idea or that idea or to this cover story or that cover story. Suddenly now, we don't really hear anything from him. Where did he go? We know the January 6th um, committee did interview him for about six hours. But then since then, we don't really hear much from him. I wonder why, I wonder what happened. Maybe he's gone over to the other side. We can hope, right? <laughs> I don't know. But we do know that there was just way more than just Trump involved. And in one of the 
articles that I read, Cash Patel is quoted as saying, well, we were trying to get this, that, and the other, and his lawyers wouldn't let us get it. And I thought, I'll bet they wouldn't. I'll bet they wouldn't let you get half of the stuff you got if they'd known you were doing it. So um, we know that there was a lot of underhanded, like we talk about often that Trump sort of runs things like a mob boss. And so you think of these little under moblings, you know, going about doing all his dirty work, planting all these crazy stories, firing up his base. I think that they are doing more to fire up his base about things than, than this is going to fire them up against the Democrats. Well, I feel like we've got a, we got a stranglehold on our own throat and we, yeah. we, can't, we can't function and it's ultimately going to be fatal. Um, Jeff, well, your thoughts to you know, assimilate all these points. Uh, uh, what, what are your conclusions? And by I'm the way, you... You, I'm going to leave you with a visual. We're watching CNN and they have a split screen. One half of the screen shows a document with the word classified on it with a line through it. And the other half of the screen shows 20 FBI agents storming the president's house with vehicles and flashing lights. Which of the two do you think is more effective in influencing public opinion? I'll leave you with that. <laughs> okay, I'd only say that, that somebody needs to clarify. You're right. I mean, you know, you're, the suggestion you make is correct, but somebody needs to classify uh, rather nobody, than nobody, clarify you know, the classification process. Jay, we cannot, you know, at one point, Trump said, I'm doing this for the public. Uh, I want I want all these documents to be made public because I believe, really, I believe in transparency. How right. about making nuclear secrets transparent? That's what we need to preserve our place in the, in the geopolitical world. Well, I hear you, and I agree with both of you that the media, the Democratic Party, the Republicans that have an IQ over 110 have not made a convincing argument to the American people about how serious it is for the president to have taken not just classified information, but nuclear secrets. Because I don't think that point has been made at all to the majority of the American public. And I don't think they know a classified document from an unclassified document because it's so nebulous. Jeff, can you answer one question that uh, Cynthia brought up? And that is, uh, is, is, is Trump got his hand on all of this? Is this the maestro orchestrating or is it creating or is it the maestro just creating chaos where, where the actors come in from backstage and, and who knows who's going to appear next? Oh, I mean, you got guys like Bannon and, and other people like that. I mean, uh, yeah, I, I don't think Trump's doing this on his own. I don't think he's smart enough. But I think he's smart enough to bring in people who are smart enough and know how to manipulate the political system. That's how he won the presidency. These are the same people. And how many did the, did the, the Justice Department try to indict? How many are in prison? And how many are still walking the streets? You know, how many got clemency? These are the brains behind Trump. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh God, we have to go now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, Jeffrey Portnoy and Cynthia Sinclair, thank you so much for joining us today. Great discussion. Really appreciate you coming. Always down. a pleasure. Take care. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.